what you're about to experience is a free worldwide interactive broadcast from Ontario, Canada. We broadcast live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get your questions in. Join the community chat room at www.category5.tv or email us at live at category5.tv. And now, let's begin. Here's your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to num episode number 168 <laughs> of Category 5 Technology TV. Nice to have you here. Send him drunk, he's home. Mm, I'm Robbie Ferguson. I'm Eric Kidd. And Hillary's here with us as well. Hey, Hill. Hey, everybody. How's it going, world? Who's excited for another great show? I know I am. Well, and a big hey out there to the Category 5 TV universe. <laughs> yeah. How's everybody doing? Nice to see you this week. This week we are uh, we're still taking qualifiers for that brand new uh, multifunction center, all-in-one printer Ooh. from Brother Canada and Category Five TV. So stick around for your chance to uh, to qualify for that. Also, uh, we are going to be looking at a simple technique that you can use to make any image look like a nice glossy button for use on the web. Nice glossy button. Yeah, we're going to be starting up a new series over the next uh, several weeks, and this is kind of our preliminary step uh, to get started. We're going to be learning how to build a website from scratch. Sweet. So tonight we are going to be doing glossy buttons, which is going to be something that we're going to be tapping into that knowledge uh, down the road. Hillary, what do you got coming up in the news for us? Lots going on in the world of technology, as always. Coming up in the newsroom, Microsoft accidentally announced a couple months back that Windows 8 would not be ready until 2012. And we'll tell you about it in case you didn't hear about the news previously. In current news, more than 70 sites alleged to be selling counterfeit goods or offering pri pirated content, they've been shut down by the U.S. government, and it's making the U.K. government feel that they want that amount of power, too. LastPass has acquired the Xmark service. Planet Calypso introduces a new group of islands with plans to sell the in-game land. And we know how much you all love gingerbread at this time of year, so we'll talk about the latest release of Android version 2.3. Stick around for the latest news from the Category 5 TV newsroom. Mm. I love gingerbread. Love gingerbread. All right. So does Gadget Wisdom Guru. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well. Sounds great, Hill. Thanks for being here tonight. Now, you, you I, I'm surprised you actually made it tonight. What's, uh, what's going on where you're at? You will not believe this. I have been trapped in my house for two days, and tomorrow will be day number three because there is a mother load of snow happening. It's been snowing nonstop for two days now. Um, they've shut down the city and are declaring it in a state of emergency. No buses are running. All the colleges, universities, um, elementary and high wow. schools in the city have been shut down. So it's really crazy, and I'm kind of scared. I'm worried I might never make it back alive. Welcome, welcome to Canada, eh? But yet, I know, you, can still, you can still broadcast through the wonders of the web. You have lots of food and water? Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> good. We got lots of food. We're okay for now, but if this keeps up, I, I don't know. I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, thanks for thanks for turning up tonight. You can join us in the chat room, category5.tv. be nice to have you there if you have any questions for us. Uh, and Hillary, of course, is joining us in the chat room as well. And uh, I guess you've got lots of questions coming in as well. Great to see everybody. We are broadcasting tonight in a higher resolution, and you're going to notice if you're watching the RSS feeds that we are stepping our way up to full HD. There you go. There you go. So we're looking forward to uh, what the next couple of months will bring with the uh, increase in quality, uh, and certainly let us know what you think. Already seeing in the chat room that uh, people are noticing a difference in the quality of the feed, and uh, certainly, most definitely, in the RSS feeds you should notice as well. Good to see everybody joining us in the chat room. Lots of people there. You can join us in the chat room. It's uh, on Freenode in the room uh, Category 5. Or, of course, you can get there straight through our website, Category5.tv. And uh, we'd love to have you join us in the chat room and be able to say hey. <clears throat> well, hey. I'm ready for you. You ready for a question? I'm ready. All right. Oh, How much oh. snow are we going to get? I, I just I shoveled once already today, and I've got this much in my driveway again. Yeah. And put that much on top of my car again. That's the thing, eh? Yeah. It's unreal. What the heck? Whatever. Okay. It's Canada. Welcome. Canada, eh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is from John. And this came in via email. Hiya. I found your web page through a link on the Unraid forum. Watch the video where you built an, an Unraid server from scratch. Very informative. 
It's a project I'm looking forward to undertaking soon. The reason for the message is because I can't register with your web page. And he's got a sad face. Aww. Yeah. That is colon and a right parenthesis. Okay, left parenthesis. I filled out the form and hit send and get an error back telling me the session has expired, cookies aren't enabled, etc. I'm pretty sure the session couldn't have ended as I refreshed the page, filled the form, and hit send in less, I'm sure, than a couple of minutes, and checked as cookies are set to accept in Firefox. Any ideas what I'm doing wrong? Look forward to hearing from you shortly. With kindest regards, John. Cheers, John. Uh, what you, well, there's a couple things. First of all, if you've already registered on the website, um, then that's cool. You should be able to log in. Just clear your cache and, and clear out all your cookies on the site before you try to log in. But because the site is under lockdown, which means uh, we're not accepting any new registrations at the moment, that's because we are completely rebuilding the website from the ground up. And part of that process is converting our entire user database over to a new format. Um, so in order to do that, we had to, well, I had to make the decision to completely um, lock down the uh, the website from new registration. So if you're a new viewer uh, or a new registrant on our website, category5.tv, then it's possible that through this transition period, you may, like if, if for example, you had started the registration process at one point and then didn't respond to the email right away, then it went into lockdown during that period and so you're, you're not able to get uh, fully signed up. So in a case like that, you can pop me an email if you like, live at category5.tv uh, with your user credentials and I'll go in and I can activate the account manually. Uh, but certainly as, as we're in the process of developing the new website, it's going to be uh, uh, pretty fantastic, but it means no new registrations during this time. So January 1st is the date uh, that you want to uh, make sure that you're registered. That's when the new website launches, um, but any time before then, you can still use the website. Obviously, all the, the services are available there, uh, and the lockdown will not affect your ability to use Category 5's website. It just means that you can't register as an insider at this time. So, Sorry for the inconvenience for those of you who are affected by that, but it's one of those inevitable things where you know, we've got to make a decision where it's, okay, we're going to have to lock it down in order to make this really happen. So I'm very excited about some of the new features that are going to be coming. Just gonna have to wait. To yeah, well, that's the thing. <laughs> Speaking of uh, the new website, thank you to all the, uh, the volunteers who have, have asked to become a part of the beta uh, process. If you're interested in being a part of that process, which means uh, just basically using the website before it's actually ready, uh, reporting any kind of issues through the uh, beta forum, and uh, also just submitting your ideas and potentially uh, even helping out with some of the copying and pasting and the mundane tasks that have to take place. Uh, as much as possible, I'm using, I'm creating systems to automatically convert the MySQL databases over to new formats, but sometimes there are things that have to be uh, copied and pasted manually. So that's, uh, if you are interested in being a part of that process, email me live at category5.tv. Just mention uh, the beta project or the, the beta team in the, uh, in the subject line of your email. That'd be great. We'll get you on the list. Well. Apparently with this new higher definition, <laughs> I'm really taking a beating here in the you chat are. room. Yeah, it, so. it's inevitable. Sorry about that. Yeah. I would have I would have warned you, <laughs> but uh, look at that. Oh. Can, look at how clear the mug is. Which mug? Jeez. This mug or well, that, oh, that mug? Yeah, you can certainly see every little grain of hair on the chin for sure. Well, okay. Let's uh, let's move on here. <laughs> Be kind to this man. Yeah. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. He takes a lot from, from you. He takes even more from me. Oh, my goodness. So. I still want to know whether it really should be pronounced beta or beta. <laughs> Alpha, on, beta. On the beta page, it says, you say beta, <laughs> I say beta. Okay. Which is more beta. No, sorry. I'll, I'll move on here. We have a question here from Greg. Hey, Greg. Yes. And uh, hi, Robbie. I have a Lenovo Edge laptop, 4 gig RAM, 500 gig hard drive. Came with Windows 7, and I would like to dual boot with Ubuntu 10.10. .10. I would like to give Win 7 50 gig and the rest to Ubuntu. I copied and pasted the partition table at the end. I'll show that to you in a second. All right. I would like to know, one, do I partition the drive with Win 7 or Gparted before installation? 
Two, do I create a swap partition manually or do I leave the Ubuntu installer to take care of that? Three, do I leave the recovery partition or delete it or back up to DVD? Kind regards, Greg. All right. Thanks, Greg. Um, first of all, it really depends. The answer to your question really is going to depend on how um, tech savvy you are with partitioning a Linux computer. And the reason for that is because Ubuntu has a fantastic um, automatic um, partitioning system so that you can just tell it, you know what, use up, use some of the free space. I think it's called just free space. Install to the free space on my Windows 7 system. It'll automatically resize that Windows 7 uh, partition down, create all the needed partitions within the freed space, and you'd be good to go. So that's, that's really the, the end user, uh, super, super easy way to do it. I'm just looking at your partition table here, um, just because you mentioned it and included it. So we've got three partitions on the drive right now. One of them is a, is a recovery partition, is that right? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> I would leave the recovery partition because, well, here's, here's what I would actually do, and this is the, the way I did it with my laptop. I, don't, I, I actually don't ever use Windows 7 on my, on my laptop, but it did come with it. So rather than throwing away that licensed copy of Windows 7, which Maybe one day I'll want to, you know, throw that back on here, dual partition, and use it for uh, Planet Calypso or something on another partition. There you go. In order to make it so that I still have that option, what I, the first thing I did, and, and the best thing that you can always do right off the bat is, Hillary, do you know? Do I know? Back up. Nope. Back up your stuff. She's looking at me like, I was chatting in the chat room. No. Uh, you want to back up your stuff right away. That's the first and foremost thing that you want to do. Um, and in a case where you've got your Windows 7 partition set up and it's working and everything, I would say do a clone of that hard drive. Make, a, make an image of that hard drive using something like Clonezilla, uh, where you know, it's a free download. You can download it. You can create an image of that, uh, of that entire partition. And then you can mess around with it and re, uh, recreate the partition table if you ever need to, if you ever want to revert back in time kind of thing. So by creating a Clonezilla part uh, image of the existing Windows 7 system, you've got your uh, recovery partition, you've got your Windows 7 partition, all that stuff is now built into that uh, cloned uh, image. Then boot up from your Ubuntu uh, CD and uh, let it do the partitioning itself, if you, unless you feel confident in, in uh, doing the partition table yourself. I would say let uh, let Linux take care of it for you if you're reasonably novice as far as doing that kind of thing because you can break your ability to boot, so always do have a backup. Um, but essentially, it, it makes it so easy that I don't think you'll have any trouble. So, but that uh, that image, having that image, is a really great fail-safe because worst case scenario, if everything breaks or down the road, if you decide, you know what, I, I've one of the problems that you can run into in a dual boot environment is that Windows will degrade just like it normally would. Eventually it's going to get viruses, eventually it's going to have uh, issues that are going to make you want to reinstall Windows. Um, whereas at that same time your Linux partition may be working just fine so you don't really want to have to go through a whole process of wiping out everything. You, so creating those images you could revert back to previous points. So, But uh, definitely have an, have an image then let, uh, let Ubuntu do the partitioning for you, first time at least. Down, down the road, if you want to try it yourself, then I would give it a go. Sounds like uh, good advice. Does that, uh, does that answer the question? There were, th there were three points there. Do you let Windows 7 do it or Gpart Ed? I would just do it through the CD, through Ubuntu. Do you create the swap partition again? Yeah, just let it, let it automatically do it. Unless you feel confident enough, you can. I did mine manually, but that's because I wanted control over how much space was allocated, like specifically. These days, though, and with a larger hard drive, it's not uh, it's not that big of a deal to to make it exact, right? So, cool. All right. I hope that helps, Greg. Thanks for thanks for your question. This is Category Five Technology TV. You'll find us online at www.category5.tv. Nice to have you here tonight. And uh, if you'd like to email Eric. It's live at category5.tv to get your, uh, your questions in. Or, of course, in the chat room right off of our website, category5.tv on Freenode. Cool. All right. All right. Well, it sounds like a little easier question. <laughs> hey, Robbie, 
When you get around to it, could you update the portable MP4 and DivX feeds for last week's show? I gotta ask. Thanks. I gotta Dave. ask. Is anyone else thinking this? How's your eyesight tonight? Do you do you notice this? What? You, what? You read what? An e every time you read an email, you're like, okay, okay, well. <laughs> All right, I see an email here from Greg. <laughs> the reading glasses are a little little smudgy. I'm starting to get inside my personal bubble there every time you read an email, you know. The camera guy told me to move in. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Notice he avoided no, I, the I, question. I cannot work under these conditions. <laughs> but there is candy. You like a candy, Hillary? There is candy. Oh, you nope. got you to warm me. Oh, would you I like a candy, candy, Hillary? Okay. Oh. The gum? <laughs> it's very like festive. Got gum or lollipops and stuff. Yeah. Our very Christmas festive. candy stash. Very festive. There you go. So you're not answering that question, are you? <clears throat> What's that? <laughs> the one from our friend David Masters. Hey, Dave. Says, hey, Robbie, when you get around to it, should I move in this way? Do. Could you update the portable MP4? Now yeah. he's talking while I'm talking. I cannot work under these conditions, Hillary. Well, maybe I can. <laughs> maybe if I get a raise. No. So... When you get around to it, could you update the portable MP4 and DivX feeds for last week's show? Thanks. Dave. What was it that you called last week's show? Did you, do you remember? I thought that was brilliant. Eric's little nickname for our thrown together show when after oh, the baby was born. Oh, I do born. not remember what you I You don't remember what you I called it? I don't remember. The Seinfeld episode. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of like, yeah, it, it didn't really have a... There was no, there was no there real was no plot. Set direction. There, there, there was, was no, no, set no plot. No, it was, it was kind of like yeah. It, it had a couple of humorous moments, and but really at the end of it, you're just like, what did I just do for an hour? <laughs> 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 so that's what you're missing there, Dave. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, what's going to happen with the uh, MP4 and DIVX feed? And the reason that last week's was not a priority is last week uh, was was just after the baby was born, and and it was a very different out of format show. Um, but a lot of fun, granted. I'll say you got to see it. Well, did we, did it. we have too much fun, Dave? We always have fun. So the MP4 and DIVX feeds will be up to date. Uh, I'll do that for you. Um, in the meantime, oh, I would love to get an idea uh, for how, of how many people are actually using the DIVX as well as the uh, MP4 feed actively and rely on those because we do have the H.264 feed which is the highest quality uh, feed and you're going to get the the full resolution high quality uh, video through the H.264. DIVX and MP4. Uh, MP4 is still based on that old 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 320 by 240 um, spec so it's very uh, it's much lower quality than the main feed um, but the file size is still about the same so I, as we build the new website, we need to get a feel for uh, whether or not, Dave, the, the MP4 feed is still advantageous to keep that going uh, because of the fact that it is such lower quality. Some people may have devices that rely on it, though, so that's why I'd like to know. So if you could let me know about that. And the DIVX, I can understand um, that it's helpful to have DIVX video, so that will continue. Um, so we'll, we'll get that up to date for you for sure. Ever mind mentioning that they usually get the MP4, but I'd love to know if, if that's just because you subscribed to it two years ago and it's just the, the one that you've had downloading all this time. Because understanding that um, that, that file is you know, two to three hundred megabytes and is only 320 by 240 maximum resolution, whereas you can get the, uh, the 480p and now the 720p feed um, that is about the same size as far as the uh, the file download is, um, but you're going to get that from the H.264 feed. So, hope that uh, kind of clarifies where where things are going with that. But it, it just is like if you're going to download a, a two to three hundred meg file, it might as well be super high quality as opposed to the old format. Okay, that's that's my wondering. But we've kept that going over the years, and uh, I can certainly continue to do so if people are actively using it for a purpose if there's a reason that, uh, that you require that over the uh, H.264. So let me know, live at Category5.tv. <laughs> Evermind's going to give the H.264 uh, files a try and let, okay. let us know if it's going to work on, right. their, uh, on their media center. Jot says I touched it, I eat it, but it's wrapped in plastic, Jot. 
You're easily distracted. Uh, well, he's giving me a... Put a bowl of candy in front of him. <laughs> Nano dots and candy. Anything that's small and can be played with. I mean, you've, you've, got, a, you've got a mic on and you're, and you're sitting here and... Well, that, that was for Jot. I wanted him to hear oh, okay. it really was in plastic. Thanks, Jot. Thanks, Jot. Yeah. Way to go, Jot. There you go. <laughs> you're oh, going to get me fired. <laughs> dear me. Dear me. Okay. All right, we got a, enough time for another question before we uh, we get into the news, if you've got one. And, if, of course, if you've got a question for us in the chat room, category5.tv. Love to hear from you there. Just calm yourself, dude. <laughs> Are you playing tonight? Well, not with Chinese handcuffs. That's what, that's what get, GWG was suggesting for me to stop my fidgeting. Yes, I'm playing. Then he my. would fidget with those, dude. <laughs> It doesn't matter what it is. You give him anything, and he's fidgeting with it. I, I, I don't know if you noticed, but we, and I mentioned it on an earlier show, but we put these pens on the, on the air. They're great pens. These are super anti spyware.com pens. So, you know, they're, they're uh, one of our supporters here at the show. But we're not holding these pens for the purpose of advertising super anti spyware. We're holding these pens because the clackety ones <laughs> he wouldn't stop playing with. Wow. <laughs> So that's the story. Anyway, back to the tech. But was he this hard to get along with when you were here, Hillary? Oh, never. Just because, <laughs> you know, he's wonderful. He's a, he's a good old boss. Love having him around. Aw, Hillary. Oh, boy. You're so sweet. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I don't like Hillary anymore. <laughs> Easily offended. Easily offended. <laughs> No, seriously, have you anything tech to say? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize I was here for that purpose. Okay, well, you, you just you ask you ask your question. No. No, okay. No, All right, so eight minutes to the news. What are we going to do? Eight minutes? This question, you should be able to cover it in eight minutes. <laughs> All right. We have something from John Steers. Hey, John. Hi, Robbie. He has a new Win 764 bit box and is trying to understand if Ubuntu 64 bit is the way to go now. Okay. Well, let's, let's hit, it looks like a multi part, is it? It does. Does it look like, so let's hit each, each thing at a time. Well, you, you and I, you will be John. I Hi. will, I'll be Robbie. So you, you, you ask the question. So first thing, is it the way to go? First thing I would check, John, is how much RAM is in that system and how much RAM do you eventually want to have? Reason being, okay. Well, there, there's two things, but the RAM, if you've got more than four gigs or if you plan to ever have more than four gigs, you've got to go 64-bit, plain and simple. Because it's Windows 7, though, you could run into application and driver issues. Unlike Linux, where if you, you, know, if you install something and it's only available as 32-bit and it just installs the 32-bit libs and you're good to go, Windows is going to be a lot more problematic. So Ubuntu... 64-bit, on the other hand, is going to give you a lot less trouble as far as compatibility goes between 32 and 64-bit. Of course, you're going to possibly run into issues with some things. Uh, Adobe is uh, one of those companies that never seems to really keep up with, uh, with other technology. But uh, yeah, It says no support for 64-bit AMD version. Of Adobe Flash. Well, there is. There, if you use Perfect Buntu, you can download it from perfectbuntu.category5.tv. And I'll post the link in the show notes for uh, episode 168. Uh, you'll be able to install Flash, no problem, on 64-bit Ubuntu. Um, with Windows 7, though, you can have a lot of issues with compatibility with your 32-bit software, 32-bit drivers. With Linux, with Ubuntu, you're going to have, uh, it's pretty much anything you can do on the 32-bit, the you can do on the 64-bit. There's there, We're just in this time that's exciting where everything just works as well in the 64-bit as it does in the 32, with some exceptions, of course, uh, but generally speaking. Um, so I would say, definitely, if you're going to eventually go more than 4 gigs of RAM, I would absolutely go with 64-bit. And uh, personally, I would probably do that anyways if my processor were to support it, um, just because of the fact that you're going to get the benefits of a 64-bit OS. So, Without getting into big details about about uh, you know the speed benefits of 64-bit and whether the application maybe you should touch on those. Bit. Well, you're going to find not in the eight minutes to go to news. Or well, you're going to find in the forums and stuff. Okay. If you if you really delve into it, people are going to be saying that oh well, you could install 64-bit, but 
if your application is only 32-bit, it's only going to run in 32-bit speeds and stuff like this. Really kind of irrelevant when it comes to um, just it works. 64-bit is, is extremely uh, easy to get. Like it's, it's just as easy to install and get working as your 32-bit now. Uh, years ago, it was really difficult to get 64-bit going on your system. Now it's not. Um, so you might as well do it if you're going to go over the 4 gig uh, max on your RAM. So. Okay. Okay. So next question. Let's John. see. Well, you already touched okay. with the 32-bit, uh, so All right. no, go with the 64. Um, it's running the ISO on DVD, or I am, since I'm John. On a now. DVD. Burned with Win 7 burner. Okay. It did okay, but can't do anything. With no flash player, can't listen to my podcasts. Now, when you say it can't do anything, now first of all, the the ISO for Ubuntu is a CD ISO, not a DVD ISO. Um, so you might try a CDR disc, um, w which may or may not, depending on your hardware, uh, affect the, your ability to boot from that disc. Um, get a CDR, burn the ISO, make sure that the you know you should be able to boot from it, and then uh, boot up, install it to your computer first and then run Perfect Ubuntu or any other system to install your Flash player, and you'll be good to go. Um, now, good guy also mentioning that, of course, there are Ubuntu DVDs, and that's true. There's like the there's the DVD version of Ubuntu, but that's very it's not as common. Like that's not the one that you're going to get just by default on the Ubuntu okay. website. So, I'm I, I'm going to guess that you're probably using the the CD ISO, but. If it's the DVD, then then maybe I'm wrong in, in that comment. So thanks for the, the note there. Okay. Okay, therefore I'm reluctant to install. Okay. okay. What do you think of using SATA, S-A-T-A, to IDE connectors so I can use my old WinXP system? Oh, okay. I've tried KVM switches, but they don't work. Okay, so we're moving out of the Linux and 64-bit questions here. I think uh, just to finalize those thoughts, we're going to go 64-bit if we're going to go over the 4 gig limit of, this, of the 32, and um, whether we should be reluctant to install based on Flash. And I would say no, uh, because that's one application. It's necessary, of course. Like, ask anybody who's using Ubuntu Linux. I've got Ubuntu 64-bit on any of my computers, and I've got Flash working just fine using Perfect Ubuntu as, as the installer. Um, so you won't have any trouble there, I don't think. So it's more problematic than some other applications because, uh, like I say, Adobe is not very accommodating, but, uh, but there are ways to install it. Absolutely, no problem. Um, what do I think of SATA to IDE uh, adapters to run your IDE old hard drives as SATA hard drives on your computer? Is that what we mean, or are we going the other way around on your old WinXP system? Well, from what I've read, SATA to IDE connectors should allow me to use my XP oh, system SATA with its native IDE, IDE drivers. So you want right to go the opposite wrong. direction. Yeah. We're taking an SATA hard drive and making it an IDE hard drive. So you're taking a drive that's designed to, to carry 300 megabytes per second as its throughput, and you're taking it down to 133 megabytes a second. No, his XP's on an IDE drive. Right. And he wants to hook it up to a SATA. Put it in a computer with SATA? Yeah. So it, the opposite would be true then. But you'd be taking a drive that is 166 megabytes a second, its bus speed, and running it through a computer that's designed to take 300 megabytes per second, possibly six if it's SATA3. Right. So in that case, you, you won't be getting the performance. The, either way, whichever, whichever way is true, uh, you're not going to get the pr performance of a true SATA hard drive, plain and simple. Those those uh, adapters are excellent for, um, like I would use them if I have an old ID hard drive and I need to transfer the data onto uh, my Unraid server, for example, move it onto another device. Whether you'd want to use that as your as your system hard drive or not, using an adapter, it's going to degrade your performance, uh, cut your your speed of your hard drive in more than half of what I'm it would just be. wondering if maybe. And I could be wrong. Sure. That John wants to maybe be able to run a third system. He's got the Win a Seven third computer. He's got, but all right. not the same computer. Just you know, maybe oh, a, a tri OS. triple boot, perhaps. Oh, on I could be wrong. Drives. But that's. Okay. But I'm thinking he wants still to have his I XP uh, configuration. Windows XP on that old hard drive. Yeah. Um, use the old hard drive. Oh, okay. So so same thing still goes. But XP, you're asking about using an adapter, so I have to assume that the uh, 
XP drive is coming out of another computer, and you can't take a Windows XP drive and move it from one computer to the other because it's just going to all your drivers are going to be. Yeah, it's going to blue screen as soon as you turn it on. You can do what's called a repair install, but at that point you might as well have just reinstalled it uh, on another on another hard drive that actually uses the the proper bus SATA. Um, so I, I would probably stay away from that to be honest with you. If you want to have XP as a as a triple boot system, throw it on another partition or uh, install another hard drive that's SATA and just do a clean install of uh, of a nice clean Windows XP installation. Ah, you could run terabytes uh, boot it. Boot it NG for triple booting. Uh, another one, uh, another bootloader that's uh, easy for. Now this is kind of getting away from that stuff, but something you might want to look at is. Uh, oh, now I'm gonna forget the name. <laughs> It's one of Acronis's products. Disk director or something like that. Ah, I was right. Acronis Disk Director is a commercial application. That's one that's pretty neat as far as doing multiple partition booting. It makes it really, really easy to repartition your hard drive and expert level. Yeah, it's it's, it's cheap, forty nine ninety nine. What was the other one that was recommended there in the chat room? Um, Terabyte Boot it NG, wasn't it? By Boot Terabyte. It. Terabytes Boot It NG. Boot It <coughs> Next Generation. See, it's also commercial. It's thirty four ninety five. I haven't used that one, so I couldn't say whether or not it's uh, it's as good as Acronis. But maybe compare the feature set between between the two. That's cool. in American dollars. It's all relative. That's pretty now. close if yeah. you're in Canada, isn't it? it? Yeah, it's not like a year ago when it made a difference. Okay, I hope that helps. Did we cover everything for John? I think uh, for it was John, right? Yeah. Yeah, John in Dallas. Hey, Dallas. All right, John. Let us know if I haven't been clear on something, or if uh, if you need any any uh, uh, better explanations about any of that stuff. Um, and and certainly send us uh, more information uh, about your your specific. Uh, Requirements, what it is that you you want to do, and I'll I'll be happy to uh, to give you a hand with that if I can. All right, so that uh, that pretty much takes us there. We're ready. Yeah, how's it going, Hill? Oh, it's going, and I got plenty of news for you coming live from the Category Five TV newsroom. While not new news, for those of you who didn't hear it the first time, a posting on Microsoft's Dutch site suggests that we'll have to wait until 2012 for the next release of Windows. Microsoft declined to comment and the message was rapidly deleted, but was grabbed by Ina Fried at CNET and a host of other bloggers. The post, celebrating the first birthday of Windows 7, said that Microsoft was hard at work on Windows 8, but the release was about two years away. In place of the offending paragraph on the Dutch site, um, it was revised to say that Windows 7 Service Pack 1 is currently in testing and will be released in the first six months of next year. Microsoft may still be an expert in making cash, but is perceived as failing to innovate or to cash in on that innovation compared to a renewed Apple and an ever-expanding Google. Windows 8 will have a heavy burden to carry, CEO of Microsoft Steve Ballmer said it would be the company's riskiest ever release. More than 70 sites alleged to be selling counterfeit goods or offering pirated content have been shut down by the U.S. government. This action was taken by the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, part of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Domains seized include a BitTorrent search engine, music download sites, and shops selling fake designer clothing. Many of the sites who lost their domains have continued training via um, alternate addresses. Anyone who tried to visit these seized pages was confronted by a screen saying that the domain had been taken over by ICE, which quoted U.S. laws on copyright infringement and trafficking counterfeit goods. Mm -hmm. The action comes at the U.K. Serious and Organized Crime Agency, and they seek similar powers over .UK domains, and it seems they're involved in criminal activity. LastPass, which is a cross-platform password manager, has acquired XMARC and a cross-platform bookmark, tab, history, and password sync. Xmarks will join LastPass's freemium model. The browser plugin and most of what users uh, are used to will remain, but new features will be available, including an iPhone and Android app. Those features will be part of the, um, the USD12, a year premium package. 
you can get both LastPass and Xmarks Premium bundled together for USDO, uh, $20 US. Huh? The two services will continue to require separate downloads and will be administered through two distinct extensions and websites, although there are plans to integrate them in the future. Since the introduction of in-game vehicles, players in the Entropia Universe planet of Calypso have been able to explore like never before, flying over predators or speeding past them on land. Now, Mindark is providing even more land to explore with the introduction of the Medusa Head um, group of islands, an all-new area on planet Calypso located between Eudoria and Amethera. Amethera? I hope I'm saying that right. I'm not Amethera. Uh, deep. Amethera. Amethera continents. Yeah. <laughs> for someone looking to invest in in-game real estate, the new land area goes up for sale in the in-game auction on December 13th. Not ready to invest? No problemo. You can explore Medusa's head now on Planet Calypso by downloading the game absolutely free from cat5.tv slash Calypso. Yesterday, Google released a software development kit for Android 2.3 known as Gingerbread. How appropriate for the holiday season. Google also announced their latest developer phone, the Samsung Nexus S, which will launch with uh, Gingerbread installed on it. Gingerbread will feature user interface refinements, improved power management, and integrated internet SIP calling. The software development kit adds enhancements for game development and multimedia. Get these full stories at category5.tv slash newsroom. The category5.tv newsroom is researched by Roy W. Nash with contributions from Gadget Wisdom Guru, Becca Ferguson, and our community of viewers. If you have a story you think is worthy of on-air mention, email us at newsroom at category5.tv. For the Category5.tv Newsroom, I'm Hillary Rumble. Category5 TV is brought to you in part by Planet Calypso. This massive multiplayer online game is available as a free download from cat5.tv slash Calypso. Now, once you've got it downloaded and installed on your Windows computer, make sure you say hi. And there's something for everyone here on Planet Calypso, from hunting to mining, crafting, and just plain socializing and having fun with your friends. You can download it for free at cat5.tv slash Calypso. If you're a Linux user like myself, of course, this makes it worth the dual boot. cat5.tv slash Calypso. I'll see you on Planet Calypso. This is Category 5 Technology TV. You'll find us online at www.category5.tv. Hillary was saying there during the commercial break that uh, somebody was at the door going, Hillary, 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 Hillary. <laughs> Hillary. Well, roommates. Why don't you what are roommates Hillary for? Hillary now? Eh? What are roommates why, why for? Show them her picture now. Well, this is, where, where she <laughs> there <go>? she is. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully she'll be back. Hopefully she'll be back. She's out to get water and food and candles and stuff. For the <laughs> like, shovel us out. It's your yes. turn to shovel. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. All right, so in a couple of minutes, we are going to be looking at uh, how to create some buttons for uh, our upcoming website. Um, so you want to stick around for that. We're going to be using free software, the GIMP GNU Image Manipulation Program. Uh, so stick around. In the meantime, here to answer your questions, uh, you can pop me an email live at category5.tv. Uh, or, of course, you can also join us in the chat room at www.category5.tv. Well, there you go. Hi. All right. All right. Well, this is... Uh, Ready for some more questions? Absolutely. I'm not sure this is actually a question or a... This is from Femi. Or Femi. Hi, Robbie. I have updated feedpixel.com. Check it out. Dot, dot, dot. All right. Feedpixel. So, Com. Everybody go there. Feedpixel.com. There we go. And the, the new site looks fantastic. Uh, what this is, is it's a, it's a free podcast directory and online player. So you can catch your podcast directly through this system, uh, through the web. Uh -huh. So you're able to get your podcast from, and video podcasts, I mean, from pretty much anywhere, just through your web browser. Oh, pretty really? cool. And uh, they've developed their own player. Everything, uh, it's, it's very, very cool. So, it leads into, can we go and watch uh, Cat 5 there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Category 5, of course, is on uh, feedpixel.com. Uh, but definitely check it out, feedpixel.com. 
it's a startup uh, service, so uh, you, I've noticed that over the past few months there's been constant and continual growth uh, of the service, so uh, you'd want to check that out. I'll include a link in the show notes of uh, episode number 168 as well. And if your visitors, perhaps our visitors, want to know what is a podcast, you can go to the following link that you're going to show everybody. Oh. Well, you're not. Maybe well, on feedpixel.com, there is a, a link for what is a podcast. So, yeah, you can go through and the menu items. You can go there and you sure. can see yeah. what's there. Yeah. But uh, I'd encourage everyone to uh, to check it out. Yeah, well, that was from uh, Femi or Femi from Sweden. Thanks for the email. Very cool. All right. Good time for more? Absolutely. I shouldn't be asking. I should just jump in and you, you can pretty stop much me if you have to. <laughs> well, this one is from Peter, Peter Lewis. And, uh, hey, Peter. Dear Robbie, I know, I'm invading your space. The bubble. Yeah. Congratulations <laughs> to you both on the birth of your new baby. That was not our baby. That was Robbie and, and, and Becca. Yeah, um, doesn't work that way. Give our best wishes to Becky. <laughs> I watch your show regularly every week and enjoy it very much. It is quite late around midnight GMT, so what's that? GMT, what time is that? Zero. Is Greenwich Mean Time? Yeah. So okay. Like off of us from five, five hours. Five hours, four hours, depending on daylight yes, savings. Yes, exactly. So I try to stay awake to listen to it. I find your format very relaxing and very informal. Especially last week. Actually, he didn't say that, but keep up the good work for next year. Please let Eric know I don't live very far from Bushmills, exactly five kilometers. Wow. Wow. You know what you can send here from Bushmills <laughs> Distillery. I have also seen on TV that there is a new whiskey liqueur called Bally Castle. We don't live too far from there either. You know what? There could be a road trip involved here. Um, <laughs> Do you have a guest room? Because Eric is having some ideas here. <laughs> we don't live too far. Okay. It may not be our Bally Castle, which in Ireland and part of UK, as I know there is one in the Republic of Ireland as well. At the moment, we have had some quite heavy snow with icy conditions. Yeah, us too. However, it is not as bad or as cold as you get in Canada. Uh, regards to all, best wishes for Happy Christmas and New Year 2011. Um, oh, P.S. lives in a small village called Lervak, which is between Bally Castle and Bushmills. It can be found in Google Maps. Well, Peter, I will be Google Mapping that location. Very cool. So, I, I, like, honestly, no, like, no, no offense or anything, but Dervak sounds very Klingonish to me. <laughs> is it just me? <laughs> nope, sorry. Well, that's that's no, Vulcan. That's a Vulcan. Yeah, sorry. I'm is Dervok a, a Klingon word? Like, why does that seem? <laughs> just, just sounds that way. Gadget Wisdom Guru can, can let me know. <laughs> I don't know. I like the idea of Dervok. Definitely. Sounds like a great place. It does indeed. Oh, you want more? Okay, well, there is more. Well, I'm watching the chat room here. Lots of, lots of conversations going on. Um, and, of course, if you have any questions for me, mentioned in the chat room. Uh, Gadwill is saying that uh, if they do have a guest room, hopefully they will include a dictionary that includes proper pronunciations. <laughs> All right. Well, this is from Philip Anderson. Hey, Philip. Um, dear Category 5 and Robbie. I guess that makes Hillary and uh, me Category 5. It does. And John and, yeah, and the rest of our research team. Mm -hmm. If anybody finds UAC annoying and they turn it off, then I would like to say do not turn it off because of that. There is a solution which I would like to share with you all. It's called UAC Trust Shortcut 1.0. Notice that the new version might soon be released in the ITKnowledge24.com community which has made this tool for Windows Vista and Windows 7 users. Please note. The update about a new version of ITKnowledge24.com's next UAC trust shortcut comes from their Twitter updates. Let's continue. The tool is very awesome and does the job. If you have any program which you trust and by default prompts with UAC dialog every time you want to run it, 
then use UAC Trust Shortcut 1.0 and make a new shortcut with a signed trust that was in quotes and you will never more experience UAC prompts for that shortcut. Also keep in mind to start the background service as a pop-up will notify at Windows Startup. Very important to keep in mind. So you can download that from itknowledge24.com. Okay. And that's it. Have a nice time and have a nice day, Robbie. Bye. Philly or Philip? Ha <laughs> ha. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> Philip, Philly. Very good Not information. Phil. UAC, I, well, that's why I corrected myself. Yeah, Universal. It wasn't, I realized it wasn't in there. No. Accessibility. Keep going. Universal access. Uh, is, is no. It? User access control. Okay. On Windows 7. I wasn't even close. And Windows Vista, but nobody, nobody cares. Uh, on Windows 7, uh, you're going to get these prompts. And I've got an application here. I'm going to give that a try because uh, one of our broadcast tools constantly asks me. And even Planet Calypso, same thing. Always ask, It's not Planet Calypso. It's um, Windows, user access control. It, it prompts you and says, Do you, are you sure you want to allow this? It's Microsoft's way of, rubbing, of wiping their hands of... of any damage that you cause to your computer by running applications that you should, oh, okay. right? Rather than actually create a secure OS, they just say, "Let's put the onus on the on the user." Are you sure you? Are you sure you want to do that? Well, <laughs> you said yes, so it's your fault if you break it. Uh, but it gets annoying when you've got applications. That's why you don't want to turn off UAC because if you do, you're basically allowing any application to do stuff on your system that uh, you probably don't want it to have access to do. That's where viruses and malware and uh, fake virus scanners that slow your system down, uh, where all those, those kinds of things get into your system. Um, uh, Gadwell mentioning that they, they think that it's more like trying to emulate the privilege raising, uh, such as Linux and Unix does, uh, and I, I think it's that emulate is, is the key word. Um, but it is, you know, there, there's that it still it puts the responsibility on the user. So by disabling UAC, you're basically effectively saying, okay, anything that wants to install itself on my computer, no matter whether I approve of it or not, is going to be allowed. And uh, you don't want to do that on your Windows system because that's very dangerous. So using a tool like, uh, like was just suggested, um, that's a great opportunity for you to uh, be able to disable um, that prompt on specific applications so that when I bring up Planet Calypso, I don't have to say, yes, I give this one access every single time. Yes, that could be. You look like you're doing some pretty heavy stuff on... Uh, <laughs> you're going to be taking our bandwidth here. Oh. Probably close that down if you could. He didn't want me to Google. Okay. Oh, okay. Dervok. We'll, we'll save that for after the show. He's got like this big fancy flash website, and it's like everyone's like, why is the feed all of a sudden stuttering? He's <sighs> pulling like 800 kilobits a second. I think there. that's a little harsh. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll look it up after the show. That okay. sounds good. Fine. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. Let's take a look at the GIMP. GNU Image Manipulation Program. Uh, we've got just about uh, 12 minutes left of the show, so I'm going to pull up. Uh, I'm going to pull up a thumbnail from last week's episode. Let's, let's just to show you that this. Well, I've, I've mentioned it before. Anytime I do these basic photo manipulation techniques using free software uh, in that series, uh, I'm, I'm giving you knowledge of how to do certain things. I'm not saying this is exactly how you want to do it or take this image and turn it into this. Um, I'm basically give, arming you with some techniques and some, and some abilities so that when it comes down to actually doing something that, that you do need to do, you can say, oh yeah, I remember how to do this from such and such, whichever episode it was. So my hope is that something about uh, that you'll learn along the way is going to be useful for you. And if you follow along, if you give these things a try, uh, then the the skills that you're going to gain from it is is going to be very helpful, I'm sure. So let's uh, let's pick a thumbnail here. I've got a handful of pictures from last week's episode. Uh, every week uh, we get uh, a folder spewed out of uh, images from our our broadcasting system. So I can just basically grab any one of these photos, open it up into the GIMP. There we go. Looks good. So to create a button, what I want to do is now this is going to be like the universal button technique using a glossy button. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, first of all I want to crop it out so that it's kind of a button shape and a button size and it doesn't have the ticker at the bottom there. So I've grabbed my rectangular marquee here, rectangle select, and I've clicked into my image 
and created a square, not a square, but a rectangle. A rectangle, thank you. And then I'm, I can adjust with the GIMP, you can adjust the marquee, which is a very handy uh, thing to be able to do. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on that image and I'm going to go image, crop to selection. That's going to get rid of everything that's outside of that marquee. So now, as we look at that, that's what our image looks like. So that's lovely. Isn't that fantastic? First thing I want to do is I want to clean up the image. I'm going to duplicate the layer, make it look a little sharper. I'm going to go I'm right clicking filters. Everything is in right clicks on uh, the GIMP. I'm going to go blur, Gaussian blur, and I'm going to just give it that little subtle bit of a blur. So that now it's a little bit blurry. If you look at the image close up, I'm going to change the mode to probably a hard light just to kind of darken it and give it some there's the original there's hard light kind of gives it more of a film look to it uh, now I'm gonna grab this tool up here our paths tool now you know me Eric that I don't I don't work in vector at all you're not the vector guy. I'm just not a vector guy because I never have been good at it I'm not an artist I, and so I don't really do any of that kind He's of stuff. An artist. but I will use the path tool to do this I've single clicked one area I'm going to go about halfway through the image, okay? And notice a little bit of an angle. And now I'm going to click outside of the image here and hold and drag. And see what I'm getting there? So you can get these kind of effects, right? And you can change your curve. And you get this, this beautiful, nice curve. And you can move it around. And then you can complete the curve by going around the outside. And then once you've got everything there, I can hit enter, and it creates this marquee inside of that area. So now if I right click and go layer, new layer, and just a transparent layer, and I right click again and I go edit, fill with anything, it's black, uh, you'll see that now if I get rid of the marquee, it's got this black area there, okay? So now I'm going to use the, because I filled that black, I'm going to turn on my layer lock here, the alpha lock. Okay, on that layer, and I'm going to change my colors to like a, a gray. I've done this by clicking on my color here, and the other one can be white as it is. And I'm going to grab my gradient tool. Where are you? I don't know if they, do they call it a blend tool? Yeah, it is. They call it a blend tool in the GIMP. So now I'm going to highlight there and see what I can do. I'm only filling that curve that I created. Okay? Now if I change the opacity of that layer, bring it down, you'll see what it ends up looking like is that little bit of a gloss. See that? Very cool. Kind of a neat effect that yeah. you get there. And, and it seems like such a subtle thing, but all of a sudden it starts to look like this kind of beveled looking button. Next step is I'm going to hit my square marquee. And, and again, because we're working in layers, remember you can always turn off that layer if you're not happy with it and start again. Just create a new layer and go again. But I think that looks fine. I got a nice looking curve there. But you can, uh, you can experiment. So now I'm going to, I've got my marquee here again, square. I'm going to click anywhere and go control A. I've selected all. You'll see that the marquee is going around the entire image. Okay, I'm going to right click. Actually, I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see. I'm going to right click with everything selected. I'm going to go select shrink. I'm going to select how many pixels of a border do I want. I'm going to say, I don't know, for an, pardon me, an image of this size, let's say 10. So now you'll see what that did is because it shrunk my selection, it's actually brought that in 10 pixels from each edge. So it's got a perfect border. I'm going to right click and go select, invert, and now it's just the border that's selected. Okay. So now I'm going to create another new layer. This is going to be my border which is going to end up looking like a bevel, and I'm going to create a transparent layer. I'm going to fill that with white, which is my background color. So now I've got this white border around the entire image. So if I turn everything else off, you can see that's the border, okay? So now to give it that beveled look, you know what we need to do is we need to create like a shadow on the, uh, on the lower uh, portion of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this marquee tool up here that looks like a lasso. Okay, it's called free select in the GIMP. Sometimes my zoom throws me across the screen, sorry about that. So now I'm going to go over here to the top right corner, 
And I'm going to click as close to the point as I can. <laughs> there goes my zoom acting silly again. Ooh. OK, I'm going to try again. Click. And then see how I've got the line? That's my marquee. That's where it's going to put my marquee. I'm going to put that so that it's a straight line from corner to corner. See that? OK. I'm going to take it down to this corner. And I'm going to click. And then I'm going to take it right into the corner so that it's a nice, perfect corner. Now I'm going to go all the way around the image. So now what is selected is half, exactly half of that border. So now again, we're going to have to turn on our lock transparency because we only want to fill that one part. And we're going to use that gray that I've got in my foreground. I'm going to go edit, fill with foreground color. And now you'll see that that portion within the marquee is a darker gray because I've got lock my transparent. If that was turned off, this is what would happen if I filled it. Let's see here. Fill foreground. See what happens there? Whoops. Much different thing. So by having the lock alpha layer turned on, I get that. So deselect, and I end up with this nice looking beveled image with the nice kind of button looking thing at the top. So that works with pretty much any image, and you can do that with you know, if you want to create buttons, if you want to create, uh, we'll be using a similar kind of effect for our new website with uh, any of the player windows. If you want to click play uh, on the images, uh, like on the video, that's what it's going to, it's going to have some kind of similar effect to that. Uh, so that's a very basic and yet kind of funky effect. Yeah, very nice. And I'll call that the gloss buttons from basic photo manipulation using free software. That's GNU Image Manipulation Program available for free download for Windows, Mac, and Linux at GIMP.org. And we'll, of course, have uh, links in the show notes for episode number 168. Great little program. Actually, there's it some really little is. differences between the Windows version and the, uh, the are Linux there? Yeah, there, but, there but certainly they're, are. But they're both very similar and do a great job. And sometimes I get, uh, because I use both Photoshop and the GIMP, uh, depending on the application, mm -hmm. so, uh, so that's why sometimes I... I Forget that uh, you know what the tools are called or whatever, but uh, we get the uh, we get right. the impression, right? So, yeah. but that said, because I'm so versed in both Photoshop and the GIMP, I can see where we can we can do these things in either Photoshop or GIMP. So we don't need to spend a thousand dollars to do this kind of a, an effect. So that's a nice that's a nice thing. Excellent. Sure. Yeah, we're just about out of time. No way. Yeah, no are way. you tweeting? Well, I you just got Twitter just, up and everything. Well, I. Yeah, but I didn't want to use up all your bandwidth tweeting. Well, you won't do it using Twitter. You might do it looking at a website that's streaming videos and... It was... <laughs> Gee whiz. It's bad attitude. Totally. Totally. I was just checking out some suggestions oh, from, our, from our friend Peter Lewis, but yeah. uh, I'll have to check that out another time. <laughs> With all the uh, the changes that we're making to the show over the next uh, over the next month or so, uh, with the quality, with we're going to be upgrading our software. We're going to Wirecast 4, uh, and we're going to be reviewing that software very very soon. Uh, very excited, but I would ask that uh, hey, pop me an email, pop me a viewer testimonial. Let me know what you think of uh, of the quality of the show. If something has changed, if if things are working better or worse for you, we want to hear about it. Uh, this is your show, and we love to uh, you know we want to make this as good as we can for you. And uh, certainly, you know, that said, get your questions in. The way that you can control the content of the show, if you're watching this and you're saying, oh, this is way over my head or this is really, you know, this is way below me or whatever, that's how you control the show is get your questions in. Pop me an email live at category5.tv and you will have control over the content. Does everything look 3D to you right now? <laughs> it does. Um, sorry, never mind. That's his random two cents. <laughs> Are we having fun here? <laughs> this is wild. Good times? Good times. Good times. All right. That's it. That's all, right, that's all the time we have. Here, we? Hey, we'll see you next Tuesday night. Nice to have you here tonight. And uh, do pop me an email. Again, live at category5.tv. Pop us a uh, viewer testimonial at uh, category5.tv. Click on interact. Submit a testimonial. And don't forget, we have that printer to give away. It's a multifunction center from Brother Canada. And you'll find out how you can qualify by clicking on the interact menu at category 5 Dot TV. You'll be able to follow the links and check out the printer as well. So do that this week, and we'll talk to you again next Tuesday night for episode number 169. All right. Good night, kids. Take care. Good night, Hillary. Good night, Robbie. See ya. See ya. Bye-bye.